the specifications of the Nikon D5500 as compared to the Canon T6i and T6s, they almost appear to be the same exact camera. At 24 megapixels APS-C sized sensor, they both shoot at 5 frames per second in their burst modes. They both have video shooting features. They both have articulating touchscreen monitors. They both have built-in flash, built-in Wi-Fi, and for a pure beginner, it would be completely confusing to know which one outperforms the other, and in some cases, you just might assume they are the same camera. Their focusing systems are different. We see 39 focusing squares, 9 of which are cross-type on the Nikon, and we see 19 cross-type focusing squares in both the T6i and the T6s. For a price of $750 to $850, depending on where you get it or which model you choose, any of these cameras can be yours. Looking at the D5500, there's a couple other features you should be aware of. Built-in intervalometer, built-in autofocus assist lamp, built-in HDR feature, not some Mickey Mouse HDR feature that we won't mention is found somewhere else. On the Canon side, we have an off-camera flash transmitter built in to the onboard flash system. It's very nice. The T6i and the T6s are almost the same camera with some key differences. For just $100 more, the T6s gives you a top LCD monitor, a rotating thumb wheel used for exposure control, a sensor that automatically shuts off the monitor when looking through the viewfinder, a lock switch for both the thumb wheel and the mode dial, we also get 3 to 10x digital zoom in video mode, an HDR video mode, an electronic level, and we also get servo tracking for stills during a burst in live view. Otherwise, the T6i and the T6s are essentially the same, and for most of the video, we will focus on the major core differences between them and the Nikon D5500. Many of you have asked that I talk about the lenses that I use in these tests. Most of the time it's a 24 to 72.8 from the respective companies, though I do have a version 1 and version 2 for Canon that I use depending on what I'm shooting. In the portrait tests, I also included some 50mm 1.4 shots. I need to tell you, as if I'm giving advice to my very best friend, the skills of the photographer are always more important than the camera themselves. These are awesome cameras. But unless you know how to use them, it can be a real frustrating experience. I say this because I have two awesome crash course DVDs and downloads on both of these camera systems in the Nikon D5500 and in the Canon T6i T6s. If you're a pure beginner and this is your first camera shooting experience, I would highly recommend you take a look at them. I will take you from beginner to advanced shooter nearly overnight. If you do the exercises and watch it carefully, you're going to save yourself a ton of frustration and agony in trying to learn on your own. I'll put the links in the description as well at the end of the video for those of you who are interested. My epic shootouts are intended to be the world's greatest information you can find on two competing cameras. This is not spec sheet reading. There's a lot of websites and supposed experts out there who are giving advice on cameras they haven't even actually seen. I don't know how that works. These are real world hands-on shooting tests. I pay for these cameras with my own money. I have no affiliation with Canon or Nikon, and I'm showing you the results of what I see. I also publish my methodology so you can see how I'm testing the cameras, and if there's any doubts to any of the tests that I'm doing, I invite you to repeat them on your own. You'll probably see the same results. The first test I'd like to get into is the focusing systems, specifically for sports shooting. The three servo sports tests I want to perform are number one, a side-to-side -side moving subject with the sun behind the shooter. Number two, a fast moving forward motion subject with the sun to the shooter's back. Number three, a subject moving away from the shooter into heavy backlight. The plan is to shoot with the fastest burst speed that has continuous autofocus. I'll use the furthest left or right focusing squares, shoot on JPEG, count the out of focus shots, and determine an accuracy percentage based on the total number of shots taken. For side to side motion of a moving subject, the D5500 scored a 70% and the T6i T6S combo scored an average of 94%. For a subject moving forward into good front light, the D5500 scored 57% and the T6i T6S scored 
For a subject moving away into strong backlight, the D5500 scored a 59% and the T6i T6S scored an average of 70%. I was curious to know whether or not the low scores on the Nikon D5500 was because I was using a non-cross-type focusing square. So I redid the front light test using the center focusing square on both cameras. Sure enough, the D5500 scored a 95% and the T6i T6S scored a 98%. So what this means to me is that the cross type focusing squares on both cameras are actually outstanding. The strength of the T6i and the T6S is that all 19 are cross type and they cover more of the frame, whereas we are limited to only nine cross type squares in the middle of the D5500. My recommendation is that if you own a D5500 is to stick with those center focusing squares for shooting sports and your focusing accuracy will greatly improve. So a camera's buffer performance is basically how long it can shoot at its maximum frames per second before it starts to slow down writing to the memory card. Both cameras are rated to five frames per second. We're going to do the test both with RAW and JPEG and we're going to listen to kind of hear when this effect happens. So first camera, T6i. Lauren, you ready? Set, go. Interesting, so on the initial burst, I'm hearing about seven or eight, then it slows down a little bit, becomes inconsistent in how fast. Well, let's take a listen to the Nikon D5500. Ready, go. So in the Nikon, what I'm hearing is a little bit smoother uh, initial burst and a little bit more consistent after uh, we reach that limit. So now what we're going to do is turn the cameras over to JPEG Fine and repeat the tests. Come into the menu, set, go. So on the Canon, I'm just gonna give up. Uh, the buffer for JPEGs seems to be very deep. Now, when you read in the literature, if you are using a jagged step JPEG, potentially the camera can shoot indefinitely until the camera fills up. We're talking about over you know, 1800 images or more, depending on the size of the card that you're using. So now we're going to repeat JPEG. We're using the D5500, so JPEG fine. Here we go. Ready, go. Oh, now it actually ran out. My finger is still on the shutter button. So what we're seeing is incredibly deep buffers on both cameras. The Nikon is going to fill up at about 100 shots. That's what it says in the literature. Functionally, the Canon has the edge when we're shooting JPEGs. But when it comes to real world shooting, I don't know many photographers who are shooting 100 frames in a single burst, depending on what you're doing. If you are one of those photographers, then the T6S, T6i is going to have the advantage. I don't think it's gonna make a difference for most shooters. So considering the sports servo accuracy, if I had to choose one of these cameras to shoot a sporting event, I would grab either a T6S or a T6i, and I'm calling them the overall winner in our sports shooting tests. Another test I like to perform is to measure a camera's ability to focus in low light. I like to use the camera's central focusing square and I prefer to leave the auto focus assist lamp turned off. 
The methodology is outlined on my blog, but suffice it to say that I have two high contrast targets at different distances and different brightnesses. Then I focus back and forth for 30 repetitions, timing how long it takes to achieve 30 focus locks. If one camera consistently struggles to focus, it will take longer, and this is something we can easily see in the time differences. The T6S and T6I combo scored an average of 62 seconds. The Nikon D5500 scored an average of 73 seconds. However, we need to remember that the D5500 has a built-in autofocus assist lamp. When it is turned on, its average drops down to 44 seconds. If you do a lot of shooting in low light, this is a nice option to have. We did several tests with all three cameras to find out which one was best for tracking a moving subject during live view. This can come in handy if you do a lot of video recording. Each camera did very well for tracking with face detection and they all struggled with movement dealing with non-face detection. The major difference we found was that the D5500 tends to bounce its search more, sometimes even when your subject isn't moving, and this creates a very slight but distracting shift in focus. Tracking with both the T6i and the T6s appear to be much smoother and comparable to each other. However, when we use a continuous burst mode for shooting stills on a moving subject during live view, we see some very different results. With the D5500, as soon as we start shooting, we lose live view entirely for a split second. And if we continue to fire away on a moving subject, we can't see what we're doing and nearly all of our resulting shots are out of focus. With the T6i, we can fire away and it stays in live view. The problem here is that the resulting images are also out of focus. Not so with the T6s, where we get this different bluish looking focus box. And as our model walks towards the camera, even in a highlighted background, the T6S is able to continually focus on a moving subject in live view during a burst mode for stills. For live view tracking, I would prefer either the T6i or the T6S. If I was shooting in a continuous burst mode, however, for stills, there is a distinct win for the T6S alone. When we do JPEG still noise grain tests, for the most part, I see the performance is very similar when we take pictures of something like a color chart. To ISOs of 3200 and 6400, we start to see some very slight differences in terms of actual noise grain. I like the look of the reds and the blacks a little bit more on Canon. I like the greens and the grays more on Nikon. However, when we do a real world test, such as high ISO portraits side by side, can you tell a difference between the two cameras? Which one would you prefer? Now it's going to get a little bit more interesting. If we take a look at these four images of our model's eye and hair zoomed in at 100%, the top row is ISO 400, the bottom row is ISO 12800. What we are seeing in both cameras is an aggressive softening and compression to deal with the noise grain of each image as ISO is increased, especially in the hair. Look how it loses definition. The greater the ISO, the softer the image is going to become in both cameras. That said, I think the Canon does a slightly better job of keeping it just a little sharper. If I had to choose one over the other, the win here for me, personally at least, would go to the Canon, both for overall color noise and sharpness at higher ISOs. Seeing this result for high ISO performance in JPEGs, I was very curious to know what would happen in high ISO for video. In my standard candle tests, both cameras look very comparable up to about 1600 ISO. When we get to 3200 and higher, we start to see a distinct difference in grain here on the side of the candle. At higher ISOs, this grain difference is undeniable with an advantage going to Canon. However, I wasn't completely convinced on this. After all, we are just shooting candles. So we did several more tests, and what I learned was that for the most part, in normal, real-world shooting situations up to ISO 3200, both cameras are actually very similar. The reason I say that is that when we take the cameras out to something like a beach, and we crank them up to 6400, 
Look at the sand. Look at the amount of grain dancing on both sets of images. I know the backgrounds are a little bit different, but they're both really struggling, and I would say equally so. With that in mind, what in the world would explain the difference between the candle shot and this beat shot? This was the test that convinced me as to what was happening, and there are a few takeaway messages. Nikon tends to overexpose the image just a little bit, maybe one third to one half of a stop. Canon's reds still pop more in video. And finally, Canon's shadows, dark tones, and blacks tend to be more consistent. So in summary, for ISO performance, most of the time you're not going to see much of a difference in terms of grain unless you have a lot of shadows and darker tones in your image. And in those cases, you will get a very slight advantage for shooting with high ISOs with the Canons. Now that said, the opposite is true when we look at some of the other video qualities such as Moray which is a splotchy artifact that sometimes appears in textures in repeating patterns, as it does in this horizontally lined shirt I have. Take a look at the T6i and T6s. And while YouTube's compression softens it up a little, there is a lot of moray on my shirt. When we compare it with the D5500, it is very clean moray-wise. In fact, to me, it isn't even a contest. For moray performance in video, the win goes to the Nikon. Another very important video feature that you want to consider is rolling shutter. It's a jello-like effect on vertically lined subjects when we pan to the left or right. Looking at the T6S and the T6i, even panning very slowly, we get the jello effect. We also see it on the Nikon D5500, but the strength here is that the D5500 can also shoot at 60 frames per second, and when you do so, the rolling shutter is minimized, so the rolling shutter winner here is the Nikon D5500. Sometimes cameras get hot after a lot of use. Heat contributes to basic wear and tear and can sometimes affect the overall usability and efficiency of a camera. So this is something I like to look at using an FLIR imager. After 20 minutes of video recording, the hottest spot I could find on the T6i was 100 degrees, while the D5500 registered at 106 degrees Fahrenheit. In most cases, this is probably going to be fine, but in very hot environments, it could eventually lead to the camera overheating, something to keep in mind if you shoot a lot of video in very warm conditions. For my dynamic range test, I fire a strobe through a Stouffer wedge, which is essentially 41 little ND filters at one third stop increments, or about 13.7 stops of total dynamic range. I overexpose the first part of the strip to calibrate and then analyze using camera raw. I'm basically looking for the last interval that has a distinct and complete border. The full methodology is outlined in detail on my blog. While this technique is not great for measuring total dynamic range, it can give us some really important insights when comparing two cameras with the same exact settings in the same lighting conditions. When we compare the results between the Canon T6i, T6s with the Nikon D5500, we see that the Canon peaks out around 31 to 32, and then it becomes all grainy. When we look at the Nikon, it's closer to 36, 37, maybe 37, 38. And because each step equates to one third of a stop, we're looking at nearly two stops of advantage in favor of the Nikon D5500. Huge win for the Nikon. If dynamic range is one of your primary concerns, the only choice between these cameras is the Nikon D5500. Grab a pen and a piece of paper for this next test and list it from 1 to 12. Pause the video if you need some extra time. I'm going to show you a dozen side-by-side -side portrait images and just write down whether you like the left image or the right image more. And at the end of this little quiz, I'll show you the answers and you can see which image quality you prefer out of which camera. This is your personal opinion, so there's no right or no wrong answers here. It's just which one you like more. Now I intentionally mix up and not label these as to remove any bias you might have towards one brand or the other. 
And this is also what I refer to as the image quality test, which is essentially what type of images each camera produces. If you score in much more favor one over the other, you're probably going to be more happy with that camera. If the scores are even, then it's probably not going to matter as much. Some important notes about this test. I used auto white balance in the standard portrait style for each shot. Each set that you see was shot with the same exact exposure settings and I didn't Photoshop or adjust any of these images. This is straight out of the camera. We were a little bit pressed for time, but in the two hours we had, I tried to get as many different types of lighting shots possible, from harsh sunlight, to backlight, to shade, to wide aperture, golden hour light, high ISO, post sunset, you name it. Even when I personally take this test, I tend to have a preference towards one of the cameras, despite some minor strange things that might be going on with color sampling in white balance. Most of the time that can be corrected. So are you ready for the answers? Here they are. Score which camera you liked more and that will give you a really good indication of which image quality you prefer for portraits. The Wi-Fi feature on both cameras will let you do a lot of cool things. For example, I like to put my camera on the end of a window cleaning pole using my patented Maven adapter. Having a Wi-Fi feature allows me to compose, focus, and trigger the shot remotely. AppWise Canon's Connect app will let you change many more settings, including exposure controls, your drive mode, and it definitely has the edge feature-wise, but there are many things still missing, like video shooting controls. Nikon's wireless mobile utility app is easier to connect to, but there may be some security issues if you're not careful and there aren't nearly as many features. The Wi-Fi options are definitely cool. Just keep in mind, both have plenty of room for improvement. So when we talk about the operational efficiencies of a camera, we're talking about the number of steps or button presses it takes to change a feature or setting, such as exposure control. So the T6S and the T6i both have exposure preview. And what this means is if we were to change something such as the shutter speed, we would see a change on the monitor brightness. It's trying to predict how well exposed the image is going to be. Very nice if you're a pure beginner. I can change my aperture if I need to. We can also change our ISO. Very cool. The important thing to remember is that on Canon's, you can change your aperture and still get exposure preview. So huge improvements in the D5500, the first articulating touchscreen monitor that we're seeing on Nikon DSLRs. We can change our shutter speed. We can change our aperture by touching on the screen. It's very nice. For whatever reason, we cannot change the ISO directly. We have to come into the submenu. We could change it here. What you will notice though, is that when we go into live view, is that we don't get an accurate exposure prediction. We can still change our shutter speed and you'll notice that the exposure is staying the same. Pure beginners might find this confusing. Again, we can't change our ISO directly. So how do we get exposure preview? Well, we come into our menu, green tab, go to movie settings, manual movie settings, turn it on, tap the shutter button. So now we can change our shutter speed and we're getting exposure preview, but you'll notice we can no longer change our aperture. We can't select it, it's not in the sub menu. In order to change our aperture, we have to exit live view, Go out to the info screen, we can touch it on the screen, or we can push the exposure compensation button and then come back into live view. We cannot change our aperture with exposure preview during live view. It's a key difference between the two cameras. So what are my overall recommendations depending on what kind of photographer you are? I think the T6S and the T6i have a distinct advantage in the focusing systems, both optically as well as in live view. I thought the ISO performance was also slightly better, depending on 
what you're shooting. And I also thought they were a little bit easier to use. And I think pure beginner will find the shooting experience a little less frustrating with the Canon. So the recommendations I'm making here are for sports shooters, wildlife photographers, especially if you're interested in birds in flight, fast moving subjects, maybe race cars, or anything that moves, small children, if you have kids that run around a lot, you're going to want to go with the T6i or the T6s. If you can spend that extra 100 bucks on the T6s, I would also definitely recommend it simply because it has that thumb control wheel. Very important over the life of the camera to have as few steps as possible to change your exposure settings. It's one less button you have to press. On the Nikon side, the thing that really won me over here was its overall capabilities, especially when we're looking at the video performance. I know that might sound strange. Talk about some of these other things. But the video performance was impressive because we didn't see that more A pattern. That is not something that you can easily remove in post-production. Um, I would be hesitant to take a T6S or a T6i on a professional video shoot. I wouldn't hesitate to take the D5500. All the extra features in there, the rolling shutter, the 60 frames per second, I feel very confident with it. And more importantly, the overall image quality coming out of that sensor is outstanding. The dynamic range at base ISO, far better than the Canon's. I also thought that the look of the images themselves were really nice, especially if you're shooting portraits. So my recommendation on the D5500, landscape photographers, portrait photographers, videographers, they're both great cameras. Don't get me wrong. I, I mean, what we have now compared to even a couple years ago is just mind boggling. I don't think you're going to find a better focusing camera in the price range as a T6i. And I don't think as an overall camera, you're going to get a complete package that we see in the D5500. I also want to say thank you guys so much for your subscriptions and your support over the years. We recently broke 100,000 subscribers and I owe it all to you guys. It means so much to me. I can't thank you enough. Let me know in the comments below any questions you have or which cameras you want to see in the next epic shootout. I am Michael the Maven and I will see you next time. If you found this video helpful, you might be interested in my crash course videos on the Nikon D5500 as well as the Canon T6i and T6s. I will teach you the basics and show you how to shoot like a pro in no time. You can order them from the following links.